Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. My name is Philip Heidson, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement and advisor to procurement leaders around the world. I started out of procurement to help leaders and their teams access the resources they need to increase their impact through insight-driven procurement. You are listening to our flagship podcast where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their impact with the needs of their business. And today on the podcast, I want to share with you a conversation that I had a couple of weeks ago with my good friend, Amy Fong, Vice President of Sourcing and Vendor Management at Everest Group. Amy has had a front row seat to procurement transformation as both a practitioner and an advisor, and she currently has a specific focus on services categories. Now, today's interview was actually recorded as part of a live event. I was invited by my friends at PASA, Procurement and Supply Australasia, to record a podcast live during their ninth annual PASA Premier Convex a couple of weeks ago. So in this conversation, Amy and I talked about how procurement can expand our value proposition before moving specifically into services-based categories, categories that are hit particularly badly right now by the Great Resignation. One thing is for sure, managing on cost alone in these categories definitely no longer cuts it. So with that being said, let's go straight into the interview. Again, recorded live at Passer's Premier Convex. Um, So what we're going to do, we're going to do kind of like um, an Art of Procurement podcast, but we're obviously doing it live here and we want as much audience participation as possible. So, you know, I've, as I always do when I go into the pods, I have uh, a few questions lined up for Amy. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, expanding the procurement value proposition uh, with this event really focusing on procurement transformation. We're going to dig deeper into services categories and some of the the challenges that are being faced there right now. And then if time permits, we're going to talk a little bit about procurement operating model evolution and some of the things that we're certainly seeing here in the States. But please do put stuff in the chat um, as we go along. And I would love to uh, to pose your questions to Amy as well as the ones that I've got lined up. Um, Jonathan did a great job of introducing you from a, um, from the job role and from, um, from, well, from a job title, talked a little bit about Everest group, but my first question is really, if you could just explain a little bit to give some context to everyone who's watching today, what it is that you do in your current role. Sure. Yeah. I have a bit of a unique role, um, for, uh, those I haven't, uh, met or worked with before I spent. A good amount of time in industry and procurement, supplier management, managing complex outsourcing arrangements. And then I moved into actually for the Asia Pacific region, quite a bit of time in Mm -hmm. Australia back in the day Um, and then moved into consulting. I spent about 10 years um, at the Hackett Group working on, uh, you know, as a procurement and purchase to pay advisor, um, really focused on procurement best practices and, and how do you get to world class. A couple of years ago, I moved over to Everest Group and um, a bit of a switch. Everest Group is a research firm, traditional analyst firm focused on global services. So um, the global locations, as well as outsourcing, um, typically IT services, BPO, contact centers, engineering services, and then, you know, all of the service automation that goes Mm -hmm. along with it. Uh, But my role at Everest Group is specifically to work with our procurement and vendor management clients. Uh, So we have various membership programs. We do a lot of market intelligence, advising, as well as uh, price benchmarking in that space. Uh, So big focus on very large service categories, which uh, was interesting for me coming from more of the physical supply chain side originally, Mm -hmm. because uh, these are categories that I feel there's there's just a a huge amount of opportunity for procurement to uh, go in and optimize and not just from a cost savings perspective, but really transforming the way we manage them. Now, I want to talk about that in a second, but I can't I can't Mm -hmm. really start and let you get away from a question that I ask everybody who anyone who's ever listened to the Out of Procurement podcast will know that I ask this and it's really about your origin story. And it's, Mm -hmm. you know, how did you really get involved in procurement? Did you find procurement or did procurement find you? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit of both for me, Mm -hmm. I would say. Um, You know, I I started out in HR after school, after college, and then went into uh, supply chain. Well, I went into uh, factory HR and being in the factory realized I really wanted to be in the middle of it. So I moved more into an operations role, got an MBA, and and this is going to date me, but... uh, 
e-commerce was a concentration back then and it was relatively new uh, so e-commerce plus operations and strategy were my three concentrations um, and then went into i went to work for hp um, managing our outsourced partners so okay. much more of a supply chain slash sourcing mm-hmm. supplier management role um, so I, that was a little bit of me finding it although i hit a point where um, i could have gone or development i could have gone cons- uh, you know, a little bit more on the supply chain, or I could have been a little more on the sourcing side. And I, I picked sourcing. Um, and that was that was 12, 14 years ago now. Um, and, and ironically, it's all kind of come together full circle. So I right. would say I draw from all of those different experiences now. You know, it's interesting how many of us in the profession, ultimately, we didn't necessarily know about procurement before mm-hmm. we got involved in it. And as soon as you get involved in it, you kind of stay because you realize how much impact that you can really have um, yeah. across the business. Um, I want to talk a little bit about expanding the procurement value proposition to start with, because I say the, the context is procurement transformation really for today mm-hmm. and yesterday's event. Um, you know, here we are towards the end of 2021, of course, crazy times, which have been talked about, you know, for for I'm sure all across the last couple of days. What are you seeing in terms of the demands of procurement and perhaps how that's changed uh, even, you know, over the past 18 months? Yeah, it's really been an interesting time. Uh, You know, when I think about the value proposition of procurement, um, I would say for the last, you know, 10 plus years, we've been looking to get to a more strategic role, move beyond cost savings. Um, You know, nothing new there, right? Um, what I've seen in the last couple months since we came out of, you know, and we're clearly all at different points emerging from the COVID crisis as a, as a global company where, you know, different offices, different, uh, different levels, but, um, uh, we have seen a real shift in the services market. And, and we mm-hmm. mentioned in the last session, we a little bit about some of the supply chain shortages. That's certainly a challenge, um, from a talent perspective and just the labor force globally and every country we look at, I have I have data on different regions around the world. Uh, we really see a shortage that's driving costs up. Um, right. I believe we're at an inflection point where costs are going, we're going to be in an upwards cost trajectory for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what does that do to procurement, right? We're not going to right. be able to rest on savings as our goals. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a shift, you know, all of us who put various types of value on the scorecard. Now it's time to really prove those out. And yeah. uh, I, I think we're at a very interesting time. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, when oftentimes I've wondered, you know, how often are the cost savings that we achieve and that we uh, report, how much of those are based on just broader market, you know, structural changes, mm-hmm. maybe there's mm-hmm. just deflation in a category, or it's just it's because of technology and, and what, whatever it is that's driving down the cost to serve. And it's not necessarily procurement that has uh, enabled that. Now, there's times when, of course, we do because of the strategies and tactics that can enable it, but it's not necessarily directly, some of it isn't necessarily directly linked with our individual actions. Now, on the flip side, and cost is going up, um, you know, how how do you think about how do we position our impact in an environment where we may not be generating the cost savings that traditionally we have or that we're coming across all these upward cost pressures? Yeah, so I think when we look, and I'm, I'm gonna speak mainly towards services, or although I think there's some general concepts that can be leveraged across all categories. Uh, but when we look at services, you know, some of the areas that are really being hit the hardest um, with your big service providers coming back, asking for cost increase, um, and just difficulty filling roles both internally and externally. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the IT and the digital skills, right? So um, there's there's some demographic forces at work that make this a longer term yeah. challenge. But in even in the near term, if you look at all of the digital transformation that was planned, um, and virtually every company I talked to, I'm sure if we did a raise of hands, had some kind of digital transformation project, right? Mm-hmm. The IT talent needed for that and and really advanced skills, uh, it's, it's very difficult to acquire that talent and to retain them. So we see really high attrition. Uh, and it's a kind of, you know, you can't, you can run, but you can't hide, right? You can say, yeah. well, we're going to do more of these roles in-house. We're going to outsource less. So we're going to 
offshore more onshore we're going to use contingent contract work instead of a an sow program um or a managed service partner you can try all those things the the challenges in the economy this is an employee's market and and we're all competing for the same talent mm -hmm. um I think what you run into there is, you know, you have a, and, and I'll speak specifically to, to IT contact centers also hit very hard, especially in North America, where, you know, the default minimum wage, although there's no been, not been any legal change, the default is much higher due to a lot of yeah. other factors, right? So, so what do you look at, you know, if you're a CPO um, and your CIO needs a certain set of talent from their service providers to be able to deliver um on customer facing initiatives you know you've got to pull out all the stops you can't you can't short the company on mm -hmm. service levels or on talent because you got three percent savings or because you saved money by paying the lowest rate and and so we do a lot of price benchmarking um uh, it's been interesting six months ago we were talking about uh e-auctions and services and i was like mm -hmm. Really e-auctions, I don't know. And we had some clients that did that. They got down to the 10th percentile of the benchmark of, you know, you look at kind of the median rate that for not just wage rates, but an all in price. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're like, okay, that's successful. You saved $15 million, right? Well, that's that provider came back later and was like, we can't honor that, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can't deliver the talent, the, 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 the services that you need. Um, so it really comes down in that case to availability and fill rate. And um, we're seeing, you know, roles that took a couple, you know, maybe a month or two to fill to take four yeah. to six months. So yeah. there's a, this sort of pre-buying the way people in the U.S. were hoarding toilet paper at one point, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing it with digital skills. Right <laughs> um, it, it, we're back to, you know, toilet paper shortages as well, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's hitting from all angles. Um, so, so what do you do in that situation? And I, I think a lot of the focus needs to be on trying to get your arms around the demand and planning for the demand um, mm -hmm. and measuring, you know, how well you're able to support the demand of your, your stakeholders. Um, I have said for a long time uh, that, you know, you need, uh, if you're a category manager, you need to understand from your stakeholder, your budget holder, what are the top four or five things they care about. What are their priorities? Yeah. What are their supply base? Um, and I'm shocked at how many times I've done training and people can't answer that question. Yeah. Um, cost is almost always four or five, right? Phil? <laughs> you know, that's, it's something that actually Bronwyn mentioned in the last session. And yes, for, mm -hmm. you know, in the last session, the um, cost is a big, um, issue and a constraint and so that's something that procurement has to focus on but um it's something that you know we've been kind of banging the drum on for so long of really truly aligning the capability the objectives everything you're doing with what the true needs of the business are yeah. but understanding what the true be needs of the business are because you know a lot of time i think we think that we know what the needs of the business are and so we deliver to it rather than actually asking the question, you know, I, I only a couple of weeks ago, I did a training session um, where I brought together the chief strategy officer for a public company mm -hmm. with their procurement team to actually run through corporate strategy and all the ways that they believed that procurement could impact it. And, you know, cost really was pretty minor. It was, mm -hmm. you know, our strategy is innovation and growth. These are yeah. all the ways that you can support the business. Um, you know, you can be out scouting for M&A targets across the supply base, which help us become more vertically integrated, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding what the business really needs, I think is even more critical today than it's ever been before, especially when you're not going to have all the, this ability to just say, hey, I've saved all this money because you know, you're yeah. taking advantage of kind of downward cost pressure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can save money by paying the lowest rates. And we were, we were half joking, but saying, hey, well, the way to do it is lower what you're going to pay your suppliers and then you're not going to pay anything because you're going to not right. get you know <laughs> there's nothing you're not going to get anything price, that's demand right? management i guess <laughs> good demand management you're not going to grow the business and you're not going to accomplish the revenue goals that you know ron was referring to as well and and that's really what we're here for it's a growth market for most of our companies right now mm -hmm. or it's a recovery market or you know we're seeing all this pent-up demand in so many industries um, how do you scale? How do you bring the strengths of your suppliers? It's the first time in my career 
um, that I have seen rather than supplier consolidation and volume consolidation yeah. um, of, of your portfolio of, of providers, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, expansion looking for specialist suppliers where we, mm-hmm. where can we find, you know, yeah, we had, you know, the, the champion challenger model, that's a common one in the outsourcing yeah. world, right? We had two, but what if we add two or three more that have these special skills that, you know, are special capabilities that, we need to grow the business, uh, and and there's some risk mitigation involved in that as well. You know, we're thinking yeah. about both how do we de-risk and how do we, you know, not just lower the cost but access what we need. Um, I just there's a couple of questions coming. First of all, I just want to say mm-hmm. Sarah made a great point. You know, based on what we were talking about, um, uh, procurement origin stories. Uh, Sarah challenges all of us, and I think that I'm probably a culprit of this as well, not to say that we fell into procurement as it devalues our profession. Um, so, you know, be proud of the fact that um, that you're Definitely. in the profession. Um, Jonathan asks, what strategies do you think modern buyers um, will develop to manage more inflationary times? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the million dollar question right yeah. now. Uh, but, you know, we've we've really worked through a lot of this. We we have um, members that are facing, I mean, I, I can go through the data, but I'll give an example where we had a, a contact center, fairly large healthcare company in the U.S., three different contact center providers came to them and said, you know, we need to raise our rates. And the rates were, the increases were anywhere from 10 to 50 percent. Like, that's... Mm-hmm. That's not just a couple of percentage points, right? right? They weren't even close. They were all over the board. So, you know, they're not really collaborating. They're just all not able to to fulfill what they need to do. Um, And, you know, there's a few different tactics. I mean, I I think when you're looking at um, something like that specific, um, we do a lot of price benchmarking and uh, having your TCO model ready. Mm -hmm. And I've been telling people, you need to understand your total cost for a long time. Well, this is where it really pays off, right? If you know, A, where you are compared to the market in terms of wages to the the talent or to the rates that you pay to a provider. um, And if you know, you know, what are some of the, what are the factors that go into that? So when you do a lot of the math and the analysis behind it, yes, they did need to give a 25%, let's say cost increase or 20%, sorry, wage increase to their their staff but that does not equal a 20 percent mm-hmm. increase in the rates yeah. you pay and by the way like these providers have huge margins they have typically 25 plus percent margins mm-hmm. and we've been tracking that as well so when you start to look at some of that data even during covid their margins went up instead of down right so when you start looking into that data you're like well this should be you know i'll give you six percent and that you should be able to use that six percent rate increase to increase wages, right? So yeah. there's some just fundamental concepts that we should have been using all along that really make yeah. a difference here, right? It, and, it's it's funny you say that. That's like the first one that comes to mind for me mm-hmm. as well, because you know, knowing your data, yeah. essentially knowing kind of your input costs um, and the cost drivers. Um, you know, I remember one of my categories back in the day was logistics, um, and um, I was managing a category for a client in logistics. You know, and we had, this is during uh, oil price spikes, mm. and we had, you know, all the, the the truckers coming and the trucking companies saying, you know, we're going to increase our rates because of fuel prices. Well, actually, cost of fuel is a very small percentage of total cost. Um, and so, again, they were trying to just, you know, get get it and a lot more in return. Um, and if you don't know the market, then you just end up paying it. But you've got to truly understand, like, how much of this is valid and justified and yeah. how much of it is they're chancing their arm. Um, And if you've got that information, then at least you know that any increases you're going to pay are going to be fair increases rather than someone's just trying to, you know, make another Mm -hmm. book. Exactly. Um, And and I think on that note, you know, we see companies doing a lot more like short term, you know, increases versus Mm -hmm. locking in long term rates. We're still in a point of uncertainty. Um, You know, sometimes I've heard in the past, like you don't make any major decisions a year after losing your spouse or a divorce or something, right? right? You just hold on for a year. Mm-hmm. We're still in that period with COVID, right? We are right. not at the point where we know where this is going to go. I think there's a, a lot of demographic reasons and there's a lot of 
just you know general shifts in the economy that make us you know believe this is a three to five year cycle that we're in and costs will continue to go up so you do want to think long term and not think this is going to be like oh if i wait this out in two months it'll be over right. at the same time you know you don't necessarily want to lock in a completely different model um i, I would add to that you know when we're looking at services especially in in you know third-party managed services moving you know shifting the model around in certain areas of the business mm -hmm. uh, can really help as well so you know there's a lot of different pricing models there's kind of t and e there's output based there's outcome based there's you know kind of the managed services model um and and lots of you know flavors within all of those as well you know we we talk about kind of starve the run to save the build which is if okay. you if you know it right you have sort of your build and your run um you know shifting into a less cost you know a more cost effective or a more efficient model in the you know the ongoing routine stuff so that you can save some money there put it in managed services let go of some mm -hmm. of the control of that shift that budget over to the build where all this real important digital transformation is going on right. um and you know as you start to think about some of the tactics around that um there are you know you can typically uncover a little bit to get you through as well, or at least a model where you're putting your your most expensive resources into the right place. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked a little bit before about you're seeing rather than supply based rationalization, it actually going in the other direction and perhaps mm -hmm. sourcing specialists, you know, from a risk perspective, but also from a capability. And it kind of brings to mind kind of that age old debate in technology too of best of breed versus generalists. Yeah. Are you seeing more more of a shift towards specialists versus you know the generalists that can kind of do everything um but maybe not as well from uh so i would say from a yes i think both from a um a firm perspective you know a, there's a lot of specialist firms outsource firms coming up mm -hmm. or services firms it service firms for example um that are getting more and more attention and we, we definitely see that um i would say on the the individual talent skills, um, you know, these specialized skills for newer, you know, languages, newer technologies, working yeah. with AI, working with blockchain. I mean, those are in high demand. I think about, mm -hmm. you know, well, we both have, we both have kids and I, I think about, you know, what coding language should they be learning right. now? Because whichever one gets the premium in six months, it's no longer a premium. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta like, stay on top of it. <laughs> so, you know, um, and there, there is uh, there's constant, you know, education and retraining to get people to, enough people to have those skills. But it's a moving target, really, uh, with the pace of the way technology is changing right now. You know, I think when it comes to procurement themselves, I, one of the challenges that I hear as well is kind of this digital literacy mm -hmm. challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I spoke with a, a fairly prominent CPO in Europe a few weeks ago off the record and. Um, and, you know, they were telling me about um, their team, how they've invested in technology and, you know, invested in, in digital transformation and got all this wonderful tech, you know, all this technology that as procurement professionals, we've we, we've been dreaming of for 20 years that we'd have the ability to do some of the things and have some of the tech mm -hmm. at our disposal. But now we have, nobody really knows how to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's now, that becomes the roadblock is not necessarily the adoption of digitization, but the ability of us to actually get the most out of it. Um, and I wonder if that's just something you see as well. It, it certainly is. I mean, I think we see layers of challenges there. One is that I think the underlying data, our information is still not as good as it can be. When I mm -hmm. say information, I'm thinking, you know, the master data around our suppliers and our, you know, products and our items and our catalog masters and all of that, or the you know the spend data the visibility like it's just not that clean um, or it's it's fragmented and then we have the challenge of you know all these systems I mean you you speak to the market too you know how many providers there are out there yeah. between all the you know the the source to pay kind of platforms or suites and now there's all these best of breed providers that are popping up all over and that's not new that's this has been going on for years right mm -hmm. uh, and there's some great providers out there. Right. I mean, you mentioned I'm at a conference. There's 
there's a lot of providers here that are really happy to be out in, in public with, with people again. Um, lots of safety protocols here, but it's been really nice to, to see all of the providers. Um, but, you know, it's you, we were looking at the logos and I was explaining to a colleague, you know, how they all fit together. And it, mm -hmm. it's very complex. And I, right. I think the typical, you know, procurement leader still struggles, even if they have something, you know, something in place. Do you have all your data on there? Do you have all of your suppliers on board? Do you have all your users on board for every transaction? Mm -hmm. um, very few people get to that, you know? Right. And so the technology is there, but it's it's complex to actually fully utilize it. And um, I still see this as a challenge. Now bringing that kind of back to services a little bit, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of my background is I spent a year in, in India delivering uh, services for a captive BPO back 10 years or so. You know, and mm -hmm. I looked at the challenges that we have with outsourcing and the, the folks being afraid of their jobs and kind of resisting supporting outsourcing um, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, jobs there would sometimes they would uh, go offshore, sometimes they would come back. It just kind of depends on the cycle of a company. With technology, you know, once the jobs are gone, they're kind of gone. Um, mm -hmm. They're not coming back. I wonder if, you know, do you see from a services perspective that where these providers historically are providing people, um, mm -hmm. now those people are being replaced by technology and it's putting the, it's putting pressure on those service companies and maybe changing how they go to market or how they respond um, to that trend? Yeah, so certainly the service providers have been very uh, active in adopting new technologies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why, I, I mean, when I introduce even Everest Group and what we cover, you know, traditionally we were covering services, right? Yeah. But we can't not cover RPA because you're just placing people with RPA, right? Yeah. Um, our, you know, all kinds of automation tools. Um, so they've been very aggressive with that. That said, I, you know, we see huge amounts of, you know, uh, attrition and just the challenge at this point of uh, not that they're, they're cutting jobs, but that they're growing mm -hmm. and can't keep up with jobs. Yeah. Um, I can't keep up with staffing. And I think when you look at the big picture that we're in now, I, I might have said, you know, several years ago, the challenge is, you know, technology is, has certainly displaced a lot of roles. I, I think technology has displaced infinitely more roles that not infinite there's a number out there i don't recall it but more roles than you know just offshoring right yeah. um and i think if you get really into the details of it you start to see that however i think the the, the challenge that those service providers are facing now is that they need to be automating and this goes for procurement as well they need to yeah. be taking you know filling some of that activity with automated processes with, with technology because um it's not feasible to staff and do all of this mm -hmm. manually over the long term. We've lost a couple million people in terms of retirement and just the demographics of age. Um, and that's, you know, that's the U S that's other countries as well. Um, yeah. you know, India has a lot of bodies to throw at things, but it's not infinite. Right. Mm -hmm. And those demographics are changing as well. Yeah. And actually that's something I'm hearing more and more, even just the last month or so from folks on the technology side who are involved in RPA um, is that it's now becoming necessary because of the talent shortage. And so what was afraid of being taking the jobs, it's now, well, well, it's two things. One is that the technology is enabling, um, for example, the analysis of data that just isn't possible by humans because you need to throw 300 people at it when, exactly. you know, which you would never do. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, there is more of a demand for those more strategic roles that um, that means that we need the the automation technologies to actually free up those resources to then retrain them and, and allow them, enable them to focus somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I just want to say, anyone else has any questions, please feel free to uh, to throw them in there. Um, I'm happy to uh, um, to touch yeah. on any questions that you've got. Do you see anything I, in there? I I see the last one, and I think yeah. it's an interesting point. Do you want to read that last one around? Sure. So it's from the one from Andrew. Um, yeah. 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 So he says, in recent weeks, we've encountered sudden inflationary pressure due to shipping costs, rising fuel costs, and high demand for commodities, particularly related to construction. Should we do more to inform and liaise with economists and approach these matters more in the broader context of economic stability? 
Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm I'm gonna, I'm a bit biased in the sense that I'm a market intelligence provider and an analyst, mm-hmm. uh, and I I am in that role because I strongly think that procurement should be gathering all the market data and and you know understanding what's going on from the external market just as well as they understand their internal market. And you know I I kind of think that you know good category manager, good strategy is to understand the external market, understand your stakeholders, understand your supply base and your spend, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What's really been interesting for us, and and again, I've only been at Everest Group about two years, uh, we have a very global presence. We're, we're, you know, know, big presence in the UK, the US, and a a huge presence in India, where a lot of the service providers that we work with are. Um, We also work with financial, uh, you know, the financial investment audience right and um, we had a really a small team that did a lot of financial analysis for the investment community and uh, just in the last year we started pulling some of their data and you know looking at it more from a sourcing perspective and sharing it Mm -hmm. with the sourcing stakeholders that I work with um, you know CPOs category managers and it's been really really insightful and we realized like it wasn't such a realization for me but it was just you know another source of information um that we realized you know procurement people need to be looking at these markets as if they were part of the investment community now the Mm -hmm. takeaway is a little bit different but looking at for instance the data on the margin of your providers that's from financial analysis that's from their financial statements same with some of the attrition data that we have same with you know other other parts where really following that gives you a better sense of where things are and where they're going and it gets you ahead if you wait until they start coming and asking for price increases or you know the attrition impacts your account you're already too late you know, mm-hmm. so yes, um, certainly working with with um, econ- uh, economists, analysts from, you know, there's a lot of sources, but I do think that following what's going on in uh, the economy is really important for us. What kind of trends do you look for, you know, that kind of are ahead of the market? And and I recognize that's a broad question. It might be more specific because of the the markets that you follow. But, you know, other specific data points that you're looking at that you see tend to drive pricing or shortages or whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of different things. I think the margins were especially interesting. There's a lot of things that tie in that can drive margins up or down of certain Mm -hmm. uh, partners. Um, You know, right now we're really following the attrition and that's reported in different ways by different organizations. You need to kind Mm -hmm. of understand why you know why one is up here and why one is down there there's certain um reasons that you know you've got i don't want to name names but you know some providers might have more of a a local you know they almost do a lot of government type work where they're like in a lot of small cities and they're the employer of choice others are you know in a big city and and uh just are going to naturally have more attrition but they also calculate it differently so things like that that you know you kind of dig into and, and as you start to understand some of those differences um, those are t- probably two of the biggest right now. We look at right now in the U.S., we're looking at something called the um, the Jolts report, which mm-hmm. shows basically jobs added and, you know, people like it's kind of like unemployment, but it's more of that gap. Um, and that's been changing, you know, very actively as we came out of the COVID crisis and, you know, plenty of political debate in the U.S. over, you know, subsidies and all of that. I mean, the mm-hmm. reality is we're past all of that and there's still a big gap between, you know, the people to do the jobs right. and the jobs that are available. So um, things like that tend to be leading indicators of what's going to happen in terms of services specifically. Um, Jonathan asks, um, so we're also seeing growing supply chain chaos around the world, volatile markets, high shipping costs, missing containers, labor shortages, gas price hikes. I'm reading this out because when we go live on a podcast, folks will be able to uh, read the, the chat that's <laughs> coming in. Um, does all this justify onshoring or, or at least a move towards onshoring versus offshoring? So, uh, I, I have a lot of, you know, thoughts on that. For one, I think for many industries and many components, the ship has sailed, right? 10, yeah. 20 years ago. I mean, I started working in the PC manufacturing, you know, in the, the early 2000s and everything was already offshore. Um, there is not the onshore capability, nor is there necessarily the raw materials, nor is there necessarily the um, 
the workforce to do all of that work. Mm -hmm. If we were to, let's take in the US, if we were to do it there or in, in Australia, like I said, I, you know, had some factories in Australia, they were really assembly. They weren't, you know, manufacturing. Yeah. All the components were done and then brought in and then assembled, you know, in country. Um, there's, there's a lot of drivers that make onshoring for a lot of the physical supply chain, the goods, just not necessarily realistic. Um, and and so I, I don't think that that's going to be, you know, a split but a switch that's flipped. That said, you know, people are looking, we certainly see people looking broader at their, their geographic footprint. So the combination right. of nearshore, offshore and onshore, right? Mm -hmm. And and there's no, you know, I was just talking about this with services, you know, companies that are, you know, we're focused on India, but now we want to add, you know, we want to center in Mexico or, you know, in Eastern Europe for, you know, supporting. And we're seeing a lot of people look at Africa. And yeah. the interesting thing that's happening now is it's no longer just about labor arbitrage, like offshoring was earlier. It's about access to talent, access to, to you know, broad, bigger populations. So, that kind of trend is causing people to look at all those different options, but in very different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that, um, I think that uh, there's, you know, the, th there's definitely some, a good argument for balancing having near shore, onshore and offshore yeah. combination, risk mitigation, all kinds of, of reasons like that. Do I think that the supply chain is going to come you know, back on shore, or the, the services are going to come back on shore. No, and I actually don't think that in a global economy, it would make sense, because what is mm -hmm. on shore even, right? Right. Um, you know, most of the companies that we work with are global and serving, you know, 100 different countries and, you know, every region. So you're, that's just not efficient either. You need economies of scale. Yeah, and I agree with that completely. You know, you've got all these supply chains, um, whether it's services, physical services, or whether it's virtual, you know, ultimately, sorry, physical goods and physical supply chains, or whether it's a virtual supply chain, which essentially services are all built around certain areas of the world where you've got, you know, the, uh, the education, the capability, the experience, you can't just make that, um, you know, bring that in house, or in house, meaning bring it on the shore. Um, uh, you know, when you're talking, uh, talking about going a nearshore, onshore, offshore kind of a hybrid strategy, taking a broader approach. It's kind of classic geographic concentration risk, which mm -hmm. I think we forgot about or never really took seriously. Right, um, right. You know, coming to the fore. So it's it's more focused on on from a risk perspective um, and an optionality. You know, just ensuring mm -hmm. that, for example, if you if there is a if there's a a geopolitical event, if there's a weather event, uh, whatever it may be in one location, that you just have the ability to use an alternative supply chain, whether it's routing through different parts if you're a physical good, or whether it's being able to switch, um, you know, a call center from Manila to Jamaica if uh, there's flooding um, or, or typhoons. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have. We have, let's see, a question from Michael. Um, have you found regarding the resource resource shortage, organizations being unreasonable on fair remuneration as it's a buyer's market, um, taking advantage of COVID-19 on salary expectations? Um, let's see, you know, what, what are you seeing in terms of pay? And um, yeah, let's leave it at that, like pay rates. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I I think that I don't think it's a buyer's market. I think it's an employee's market right now, mm -hmm. um, and and I don't think that's just a U.S. thing. I think that's fairly global. When we look, we've done some recent research um, that's showing you know um, the the demand and you know cost increase or wage increase really is a global thing. Um, it's a little more impactful in certain areas I mentioned in certain countries, but it's you know, you can't say, oh, that's, that's one country. Um, I, I think, uh, sorry, there's a, there's a long piece there. I got stuck on pay peanuts, get monkeys. And that's <laughs> certainly true, right? Um, no question about that. I, I think that you, you know, it's, it's not just that it's not an employer's market. It's also not a service provider's market. Mm -hmm. um, it's truly, you know, there's a, there's a lot of drivers behind that. And I think that people coming out of COVID, you know, and, you know, 
those of us that are in, you know, more of, I guess, first world countries came on and said, you know, I want a career that means something to me. You have a lot of people yeah. who are saying, you know, my job needs to matter. I want to be somewhere where I'm heard or impactful. Um, and they're demanding a bit more. On the other end of the, the spectrum, we see, you know, um, the, a, a lot of push in the U.S. for a living wage, which is, is mm -hmm. a good thing, I think, from a yeah. social value perspective, right? You can't really disagree with that, I think. Um, but at the same time, what that is, is there, it's causing, you know, all the boats to rise, right? So if you have a large company go in and put, you know, a Walmart or an Amazon, put in a center, they're now paying college tuition and, and all this, and they're paying, you know, $18 US an hour versus, uh, you know, your call center that was paying 12. I mean, right. boys are smart, right? They're, yeah. they're going to go get the, the, the job that pays better, but the company that they feel is respects them and treats them better. Um, and that's certainly uh, that we're seeing that across the board. I mean, I, I, it's funny. I was in a um, kind of a, an advisory board meeting here that was, you know, a lot of CPOs and a lot of service providers um, and, and people like myself and, and they were like, is it really an employee's market? I looked around the room and I was like, wait, we just did introductions and six out of 12 of you switched jobs in the last two years since we last mm -hmm. saw each other in person. Like, clearly it's an employee's market, right? <laughs> you know, there's there's really no question that this is happening at every level and that drives up costs. Um, it drives up turnover. It drives a lot of inefficiency, I think, in, in mm -hmm. of companies as well. Uh, and just for some, some context, Michael um, was saying as well, like from a um like from a procurement career perspective and what i'd, I'd say that is it's very localized you know yeah. um i'm i'm certainly hearing in the states that there's um a big supply and demand imbalance for procurement staff for example mm -hmm. which is um you know really driving higher wages and higher salaries but that's very us based um you know i'd say that if you're hearing that locally in australia that it's it's the other way around um that people are trying to take advantage of unemployment uh, i mean if that's the case in your local market and i don't know whether it is or not i mean that's it's kind of typical supply and demand at the end of the yeah. day yeah and I, I think that you know the important thing to always keep in mind as we are at all different phases of COVID, is that this is happening in different stages in different places mm -hmm. so yep. um you know and it's funny in san francisco where i am in the bay area um we had a shortage of procurement talent before covid right mm -hmm. so this has just exacerbated it but it's also given the flexibility of having people work remote um as i talk to people from different parts of the u.s different countries um you know europe is a great example uh, um, two months ago our colleagues in europe you know uk or, or eastern europe and western europe as well were all saying yeah i don't think this is really hitting yet and we just did a webcast last week and we had we pulled all the data on Europe and we we talked to a lot of clients and they're like, oh, yeah, it's hitting like mm -hmm. it's a bit of the timing is when the demand from COVID, you know, when when the numbers start to go down, vaccination yeah. go up, things open up. There's a lot of pent up demand that pushes out the market. Right. And just general customer demand. And now all of a sudden we businesses need to scale back up their hiring. You know, it's just a chain effect of a lot of different right. things that, you know, um, I, I, I mentioned this debate in the U.S. too. People are, you know, living off the unemployment and it's, an, you know, that, that ran out. And even before that ran out, you know, we, we started to see this this shift. Um, and, and so I think that it will be a long term problem, but it will be something that hits different regions and different cities at different times mm -hmm. because of a lot of different, you know a lot of localized factors it's a complex yeah. there's no one silver bullet and there's no one driver so you're going to see inconsistencies we've just got a couple of minutes left so final call for any questions um from uh, from everyone who's joined us today i'll just keep a quick look on that um when it comes to because of talent because of the talent generally the talent shortages are you then seeing um a move towards kind of more flexible talent models so whereas you know employee versus contractor uh, you know looking outside versus hiring internally like what are some of the trends you're seeing um from yeah, that perspective it, it's well we are and it's really been interesting you know I, we shared some of this attrition data in one of the the newsletters i do um for you know on, on a monthly basis that typically go to to procurement stakeholders and i got all these calls from 
HR people and IT people trying to, you know, figure out the same problem, right? And it is the same problem, whether it's internal, whether you're talking about contingent workforce, you know, contractors or temp labor, or, um, you know, we do see, we, we, so we, we always advise that, you know, think end to end about your workforce strategy. And we, we yeah. do a lot of research just on work, not, you know, outsourced roles or hired roles or contingent roles, but, you know, how are you shaping work and how are you kind of bringing together um, those three different groups of, of workers to, to, you know, meet the needs of the business. Um, so we do see more of a focus, I would say right now on kind of those holistic workforce strategies yeah. across those different channels. Um, I, I think people are trying all different tactics, you know, do I, do I hire more contingent and that's sort of the short-term bandaid and, you mm -hmm. know, but there's, it's not any easier to get a contingent worker than it is to get, you know, to hire someone full-time right now, but the, the factors are the same across the board. Yeah. Do you think that that's an acceleration of kind of a long-term structural uh, trend or whether it is just a band-aid because folks are just doing whatever they need to do to get the talent that they can? And perhaps when things are, uh, I, I hesitate to say things are back to normal because I don't think anyone really knows what it's going to be, um, <laughs> but that perhaps things rebound to be more, okay, we're going to hire again. You know, I think that we've seen a shift in the the workforce um, towards more flexible work models. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that's part of it, right? That's part of this employee's market. People want the flexibility. I mean, we see a difference in companies that are allowing, you know, work from home long-term and flexible schedules versus those that are mandating back into the office. I mean, that's a big, you know, that's a big contentious thing. We would definitely have, you know, providers in India where that would have been unheard of. They, they had desktop computers before COVID and now, mm -hmm. They've they've figured out the security. They've figured out the risk factors, and they're they're offering that flexibility where they can. Um, I think we'll we'll have that. That's the work from home side. But we were already moving to more flexible workforce, more contingent workers pre COVID, mm -hmm. and I think that's only going to continue. I mean, I was just talking to a CPO tonight who was you know like we've got it. We've got this huge project digital project we need to retain these people till february and they know that they're done right it's a mm -hmm. short-term surge and there's a lot of work like that that is sort of up and down there's seasonality there's just so much that happens in our business that you know that flexibility is important now i do think we have other models and you know society that need to probably adapt to the to that um, and that's a much broader question but it's uh i, I think it's here to stay well, I know our time is up. Um, mm -hmm. Before uh, Jonathan plays the music to uh, send us off stage, I just have my very final question I always ask on the podcast. And that's if anybody today would uh, like to connect with you, find out a little bit more about what you do, some of the data that you have, just engage with you. What's the easiest place? Where can they find you? Yeah, so easy to find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. Um, Amy, dot Fong, or Amy M. Fong, I think on LinkedIn. Uh, and of course, at Everest Group, it's amy.fong at everestgrp.com, uh, Everest like the mountain. Uh, mm -hmm. So easy to find me in either of those places. Yep. I'm always happy to help. We've got a, a lot of uh, research on our site that's complimentary, um, the everestgroup.com website. There's, uh, we do quick polls uh, monthly, and some of that data has been very timely as we've gone through COVID. And so some of the, the data I just mentioned is actually posted right there, yep. as well as blogs and webinars and things that are free. So. All right. Well, Amy, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for stepping aside as well from your evening. Uh, I know it's uh, fairly late there in Southern California. So I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with the PASA community. I'll hand it back over to you. I want to thank you for listening into today's episode of The Art of Procurement. To go deeper, including access to transcripts and actionable outtakes from the podcast, join the free level of our AOP Mastermind community. To learn more, go to artofprocurement.com slash mastermind. And to find our entire back catalog of almost 400 episodes, go to artofprocurement.com slash podcast.